So I think we're going to kick this off this morning. Thank you for finding us and for being here and for joining us up at Sarasaki Center for this event. Uh, to start the event today, I'd like to welcome the Vice Provost of the International Institute, Cindy Fan, to come and offer uh, welcoming remarks, and then we'll, we'll get started. So here's Cindy Fan. Thank you. Thank you, Noel. I think this mic is for people taller than I. I'm just 5'4", and I'm shrinking, so. <laughs> Good morning. Welcome to the 2015 Global Japan Forum. I would like to, uh, in particular, thank uh, those who traveled to UCLA. And I know that there are participants from Berkeley, uh, Santa Cruz, San Diego, Texas, Mich Michigan, Chicago, London, Japan, am I missing anything? Any location? All right, I got it. <laughs> also, I really thank you for bringing us rain. I was going to apologize for the weather, but I'm not gonna apologize for the weather because we need rain. Uh, for those of you who are from out of town, I don't know if you know, but we are in a drought, so thank you for bringing us much needed precipitation. Last night, I was driving back from LAX to um, back home, and I, I spent a few days in, in the Middle East, Qatar and, and UAE, and was driving, and there was lightning and heavy rain, and I thought, am I just jet-lagged, or am I dreaming? But I'm very, actually very happy. Let me say a few words about the Terasaki Center for Japanese Studies. This is a center that is one of the crown jewels of UCLA. And Professor Hitoshi Abe, director of the Terasaki Center of Japanese Studies, is not only an internationally renowned architect in terms of buildings, he's also a visionary architect of the, of the center. And there are more than 25 centers and programs within the International Institute at UCLA. And I must say, Hitoshi Abe is my favorite director. I hope there are no other directors in this room now. But <laughs> and Associate Director Seiji Lippitt has also played a very key role in the center's new vision. This is a vision that is transnational, transdisciplinary, uh, and that is also forward-looking and historically based. And I must also say that Seiji Lippitt is my favorite Associate Director. Now, if you look at some of the programs that the center has organized over the past several years, and if you look at the titles, you notice that this vision is very global. So let me just cite a few examples. Japan in the world, new relationship between Japan and the US, Trans-Pacific Workshop that is going to um, be organized for June this coming month. Um, these are all very global topics, but the center has not forgotten about depth. So, uh, for example, one of the programs that uh, was organized over the last couple of months, the title being Japanese Literature in this Decade. So the center really has been able to strive for both depth and breadth. And I want to share with you three additional thoughts. The center's vision is very much consistent and aligned with the mission of the International Institute and that of UCLA, and that is by embracing a global perspective. We are bridging nations and populations and fostering innovative ideas in terms of international research and education. Second, personally, I'm extremely happy to see this year's focus, this uh, forum's focus on cultures of migration. The circulation, transmission, and adaptation of Japanese culture across the globe. Now, as a geographer who happens to study migration, I'm very intrigued and fascinated by the topic of the forum today. And in fact, my own work also deals with circulation and, adap and adaptation related to rural urban migration in China. Um, so, it seems to me that the forum today really exemplifies a deliberateness in boundary crossing in terms of geography, discipline, and community. And in that light, I think that the forum 
is going to be agenda setting. The third thought that I want to share with you is that the Terusaki Center is vital to UCLA's engagement in, with Asia. As a global research university, UCLA is deeply committed to connecting to students, parents, and alumni around the world and to partnering with institutions in every continent. We have more than 900 alumni in Japan, which represents the largest group of our alumni uh, outside of the country. And we have also more than 300 students from Japan studying at UCLA now. And UCLA has partnerships with more than 20 institutions in Japan. And we visit Japan very often. Over the last two summers, we had events in Japan with alumni. And this coming summer, this coming month, in June, we will again visit Japan. And Chancellor Jim Block of UCLA will lead a delegation. And also, uh, he will be part of a global forum in Tokyo. Now, we have some alumni in Japan who are in positions that we can leverage. For, for example, a year ago, we found out that one of our alumni worked for uh, Ambassador Caroline Kennedy. So through her, we actually had a meeting with her and we took a lot of pictures. Um, speaking about um, Chancellor Block, unfortunately, he isn't able to um, join us today and he wants me to, to send his regards. He's probably somewhere over the Atlantic Ocean right now, making his way back to LA. But uh, I know that he's with um, the participants in, in spirit today and he's also told me that Hitoshi is his favorite director and Seiji is his favorite associate director. So thank you again, and my best wishes for a very successful conference today. Thank you. <laughs> Professor Hitoshi Abe. Thank you, Cindy. You are my favorite vice provost. <laughs> but again, thank you, Cindy, though, for all this support you are giving us. And I really appreciate the support uh, of the university. And we've been very fortunate, actually, to have such a strong leadership supporting us for many things, actually. And of course, good morning to you all and welcome. And thank you very much, actually, for joining us our at our second Global Japan Forum. I'm sure you heard so many apologies and jokes about rain, so I'm not gonna say anything about it. But uh, to be honest, if you're living in Los Angeles and if you s don't see the sun, you get really depressed. So hopefully today, we can kind of clear your mind by interesting discussion and exciting talk. And that's what I really need also and looking forward. As you know, um, that, that this is the second year of our three-year conference series, which covers theme of the interaction between Japan and the world. Uh, Global Japan's forum's theme is migration and during this year's conference, we will actually examine the culture of migration, exploring different aspects of Japanese culture circulation, transmission, and adaptation across the globe. Next year, actually, in our uh, final conference, we will discuss the politics of migration, and we hope you will continue to join us for those discussions as well. I'm hopefully that the weather is much better. I'd like to mention that the Global Japan Forum is a the major part of Terasaki Center's Global Japan Initiative, a huge initiative consisting of events, fellowship program, outreach, research, and expanding our current network and fundraising. All in hopes of shaping more dynamic understanding of Japan and Japanese culture within a rapidly globali globalizing environment. Dynamic understanding of Japan and Japanese culture. Uh, yesterday during uh, dinner, I had a, uh, I was learning about Buto 
from one of our guests, Rosemary, the assistant professor of dance at the Texas Women's University. And she told me actually the Bruto was heavily influenced by German modern dance. And it was kind of really new to me because the, the, the many information about Bruto I hear is more kind of connected to the uh, ancient sort of a form of art in Japan, like a no or Zen or, so it's really uh, sort of going towards very mythical world of this incredible country, which has been closed for uh, centuries. And then I it was kind of refreshing to hear that actually more uh, the direct connection of the German uh, modern dance to form the Bruto, and, and it kind of makes sense. That's why maybe the Bruto actually has more interesting dynamic sort of a, a development throughout uh, Japan, not only Japan, but also the world. I think uh, this kind of uh, attitude trying to see Japan from more dynamic point of view, not very static, always kind of a result to talk of this mythical world, which is probably more inward looking, and uh, uh, you know that's probably in not the direction we want. We really need to look at this uh, Japan from more uh, uh, in a dynamic connection with uh, 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 global context and the connect in connection with the uh, uh, global culture. And that's what I'm really expecting to pursue in this Global uh, Japan Conference Series. So please stay in touch uh, with us and uh, uh, kind of participate in this discussion. And I have to say thank you, a lot of word to so many people. So thank you to, first of all, all our panelists who worked so hard on their presentation today. We are uh, so excited to hear your uh, expertise and look forward to have a great discussion. And also thank you to all students, Japanese and Japanese American community members, the International Institute, all of our donors, our staff, and of course our distinguished faculty who actually has spent so much time suggesting topics and participant. Also, I'd like to say very special thanks to our board of advisors, many of whom have traveled from so far away to be here with us today. And last but not least, thank you to the Japan Foundation for your support for this event. I don't know, yes, thank you. Now, if you refer to your program, you can see that the, the, we will have a three panels today, moderated by our UCLA faculty. Seiji Lippet, William Moretti, and Michael, Lip, uh, Michael uh, Emmerich, and by a friend from UCSC, the Rob Wilson, and I will, I'd like to thank them all for their uh, uh, hard work. Actually, it, it's been really hard work to put this panel together. And I'd like to invite Sage Lippet, Associate Director of Terasaki Center, and Panel One's presenter to the stage. So thank you very much, and please enjoy today. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm very pleased to uh, introduce our first uh, panel uh, for the day. Uh, we have a very sort of distinguished group of uh, scholars who will be looking at our theme, sort of cultures of migration, through the perspective of three different uh, forms of, of culture, uh, popular music, uh, literature, and uh, film. So what I would like to do is uh, introduce all of our panelists uh, at once, and then I will ask them to sort of come up one by one. Uh, our first uh, presenter is Professor Michael Bordash, who is a professor of modern Japanese literature and also the chair of the Department of East Asian Languages and Civilizations at the University of Chicago. 
He also taught here at uh, UCLA for many years. We actually arrived here at the same time, so I'm always very sort of ha happy to welcome him back. Uh, Professor Bordash is one of the leading scholars of both Japanese literature and Japanese popular uh, music. Uh, his book, uh, Sayonara America, Sayonara Nippon, A Geopolitical Prehistory of J-Pop, was published in 2012. It's been translated into uh, Japanese, where it has uh, received a lot of uh, attention. And he is going to be uh, speaking on uh, uh, Japanese uh, popular music uh, in sort of different parts of the world today. His presentation uh, is entitled Cosmopolitism, Bandung, and the Peanuts. Our second uh, presenter is Professor Andrew Leong, who is Assistant Professor of English and Asian Languages and Cultures at Northwestern uh, University. Uh, Professor Leong works at the intersection between sort of Japanese literary studies and Japanese American literary studies, which is a really kind of exciting sort of new frontier in, uh, in the field. So we're very excited to have him uh, here today. Uh, his current uh, book project, The Democratic Fetish, Japan American Fictions at Ends of Progress, uh, sort of looks at uh, literary works uh, written by men of Japanese origin who traveled, studied, and worked in the United States from 1885 to 1926. Uh, he also uh, has translated two novels by Nagahara Shosong, a railway worker who wrote for uh, a Japanese uh, language reading public in Los Angeles uh, during the 1920s. Um, so his work fits perfectly with our, our theme for today, and he'll be presenting today on the no-note uh, fetish on the feet of Japanese-American uh, translation. Our third presenter is Professor Daisuke Miao, who is a professor of Japanese cinema and also the holder of the Hajime Mori Chair in Japanese Language and Literature at the University of California, San Diego. So we're very pleased to have him in the, in the neighborhood and we look forward to having him here at UCLA many times in the future. Uh, uh, Professor Miao is the author of The Aesthetics of Shadow, Lighting in Japanese Cinema, which was published in 2013. Uh, he has also published a study of uh, Seshu Hayakawa, Silent Cinema and Transnational uh, stardom. So he has also looked at this uh, spread of sort of Japanese sort of culture beyond the borders of, of Japan. Uh, and he will be speaking today on Japonisme and the birth of cinema. Uh, so with that, um, I really look forward to uh, hearing the presentations and I would like to invite Professor Bordash uh, to the stage. Thank you, Seiji, for that uh, kind introduction. And let me thank the organizers at the, at the Terasaki Center for Japanese Studies uh, for the invitation to participate in this event. And I'd particularly like to, to thank Noel Shimizu, who's been uh, uh, a wonderful person to work with in making all of the arrangements. I'm, I'm thrilled to be part of uh, this really exciting lineup of speakers today. I, I, I think the, the, the selection of the program was, was, was done very well. And, uh, I, I'm really excited to hear what everyone has to say. There are, in, in the presentation I'm going to make, I'm going to use the word migration with three different senses or in, in, in three different meanings. The first meaning is what we usually understand by migration, the transnational movement of human beings under the influence of capitalism, imperialism, and other forces. As I'm sure you all know, Japan experienced large-scale emigration and immigration during its imperial period uh, through 1945. Then after 1945, ex it experienced large-scale repatriation from the, the former empire back into the mainland islands, but Japan has been notoriously restrictive in its immigration policies since 1945. The second sense that I'm going to use uh, migration is in is uh, domestic migration within Japan, particularly the movement of young people from the countryside to Tokyo and other cities to seek economic and educational opportunities. It's been estimated that between 1955 and 1970, about 30 million people participated in what we might call Japan's Great Migration. Uh, it arose precisely because of Japan's reluctance to, perm to permit transnational migration 
to provide the labor that it needed uh, to, to fuel its rapid economic development. And we can think of the striking contrast with West Germany, which when faced with a similar labor shortage in 1955 launched its massive Gastarbeiter program to bring in workers from abroad uh, to, to staff the industries. The third sense of migration that I'll be using comes from the title of today's symposium, Cultures of Migration, uh, the shifting patterns of cultural migration, the migration of cultural forms and cultural products into and from Japan. I think that's what they had in mind when they, they planned this symposium. It would be foolish to think that migration means the same, th same thing in all three of these cases, uh, but I think it would also be foolish to think that they're unrelated. Uh, to each other. And so what I'm going to try to do today is to take a specific example from popular music as a case study and use it to unpack relations between these three forms of migration. Try to think about how each determines in part the conditions of possibility for the other two. Um, what I'm presenting is very much an experiment. I think it's too schematic. I was up early this morning scrambling, trying to make the pieces fit together better. They don't quite fit, but, but we'll see what happens. Um, I, I also want to engage in a, in a bit of self-critique of my own book, uh, Sayonara America, Sayonara Nippon. Uh, in that book, I took up Japanese popular music from 1945 to, to about 1990, looking particularly through the nexus of the complex web of love, hate, love, hate and indifference that marked the geopolitical relation of the United States and Japan in those decades. Uh, in the book, I explored multiple instances of how in popular music, you become an original by copying somebody else. How by mimicking the foreign other is the process by which one acquires domestic identity. So that it's, it's by pretending to be an American boogie-woogie singer that Misora Hibari somehow magically becomes the most authentic of Japanese Enka singers. Or it's by doing cover versions of Elvis Presley that Sakamoto Kyu transforms himself into the singer of Ue Omite Aruko, or, or the Sukiyaki song. And is so often the case uh, in colonial or semi-colonial situations, mimesis functions on both sides of the divide as a tactic of co-optation and resistance, of domination and deviance. And in, in Japanese popular music, we often see what Michael Tosig calls the figure eight form of mimesis, uh, in which a Japanese performer skillfully mimics an American singer and thereby, thereby produces herself or himself as the Japanese performer who is doing the mimicking, uh, a performer who emerges as a paragon of Japaneseness. Uh, you can use this structure to analyze much of the history of Cold War Japanese popular music. You can look at mimicry and counter mimicry between Japan and the United States productively. Um, this process uh, of, of mimesis in, in popular music, in, in, in my book, I argued, arose in tandem with what we call the 1955 system in Cold War Japan. Uh, the years following the end of the American occupation of Japan in, in 1952 were characterized not legally by a colonial situation in Japan, but by a situation that had many of the characteristics of a colonial situation. Japan became what Gavin McCormick has called a client state of the United States. The 1955 system refers in specific to the merger in that year of conservative political parties that formed the Liberal Democratic Party, which would continue to rule Japan through the end of the Cold War. Under this regime, Japan became a bulwark of U.S. anti-communist strategic policy, allowing itself to be used as a staging base for U.S. military operations across Asia, and essentially surrendering much of its independence in foreign policy to the United States. But Japan also resisted pressure from Washington to rearm. Uh, it, ter it turned its focus instead on domestic economic growth achieved through aggressive trade and industrial policies, as well as through the encouragement of domestic consumption. Given Japan's subservient relationship to the United States and internal relations, both the Japanese ruling establishment and the U.S. tended to stress Japan's cultural autonomy. Uh, and we have the system that Harry Hartunian calls America's Japan, Japan's Japan, uh, emerging as part of the 1955 system. And it was in this geopolitical environment, for instance, that Misora Hibari and others became celebrated for producing a distinctively Japanese form of popular music. So that, in a nutshell, is the argument I made in my book. And I think it helps us to understand a great deal about Japanese popular music during the Cold War, but this argument also has a number of cold spots, or blind spots, uh, blind spots that are related to the problem of migration. Uh, and so let me ask, what, what are we supposed to do with a pop song that sounds like this?
It's very quiet. Let's see, we're not. And I, I'm not going to try and sing it. So. Que me hizo comprender 